Okay, looks like we are live. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today. Special thanks to both our speakers. Uh, we will start the webinar soon. Uh, this project is organized by the Green European Foundation with the support of CDN and with the financial support of the European Parliament to the Green European Foundation and support of Council of Europe to CDN. Today we talk with MEP uh, Sylvia Spurek, a lawyer, a politician, a holder of PhD in law, a legal counsel, a legislator and a feminist. Over the past 20 years she has been involved in work for women's rights as human rights. She also is a vegan and an advocate for animal rights. In 2004 she was author of the Polish government's first bill on prevention of domestic violence. In 2014-15, she acted as deputy head of the Office of the Polish Government's Plenipotentiary for Equal Treatment. Between 2015 and 19, she was a deputy commissioner for human rights in Poland. And currently, she is a member of the European Parliament and vice chair of the FEMM committee. And our second speaker is Justyna Panteleva. She is urban planner and a politician. She holds bachelor in biology and masters in urban planning. And she was recently elected in Riga City Council, becoming the young, youngest councillor. She is a feminist, activist for seven years, mostly in urbanism, animal rights and human rights. And she is a member of Riga City Council and deputy chair to city development committees chairwoman. She also is working in traffic committee. Uh, the speakers will talk to us why they decided to run for the EU and local elections respectively, what were their biggest takeaways and motivate us a bit to do politics in one or another way. We will first hear from MEP Silvia Spurek for 20 minutes approximately, then to Justine Pantaleva for 20 minutes, and then we will have space for the questions and answers. You can already uh, write them uh, in the Zoom chat if you join uh, through Zoom, or if you're watching us on Facebook, leave them in the comments. So, Silvia, the floor is yours. Um. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this webinar. Uh, and I'm looking forward to your questions, your comments. Uh, I don't have a formal speech, uh, so I will be very brief. Um, and my uh, transfer to politics uh, was actually uh, dedicated to all of these issues I've been dealing with for many years. I entered into politics because I wanted to be more efficient. Uh, as you said, uh, I was uh, in the first place an activist, uh, a lawyer in a female women's rights uh, NGO uh, in a small industrial city in Poland. Uh, then I drafted the first law on the counteracting of domestic violence uh, for government, uh, for wonderful uh, Vice Prime Minister uh, Isabella Jaroganowacka, uh, who died uh, in this uh, uh, awful accident in Smolensk uh, many years ago. Uh, and uh, then I, uh, I was an academic uh, and uh, deputy uh, director of Department on Equal Treatment, working for government plenipotentiary for equal treatment. And then I was a deputy commissioner for human rights, dealing with uh, equal treatment of men, um, uh, dealing with anti-discrimination issues uh, concerning people with disabilities, LGBTI people, uh, elderly people, migration crisis. Uh, and I was tired of advocacy work, of lobbying, of appealing, of intervening, of recommending to the public authorities uh, the solutions, 
for uh, very important issues like violence against women, like, like poverty of women, like the lack of the rights of people with disabilities, for example, the lack of right to be independent, to independent uh, living. Uh, and I decided I'm done. I need to be more efficient AI, and I entered the politics March uh, last year. So I'm very fresh uh, in the politics uh, and I still consider myself as an expert instead of a politician. Uh, and I still deal with this kind of issues, uh, discrimination based on uh, gender based on age, uh, on sexual orientation, of ethnic origin, uh, of uh, disability. Uh, and uh, I also deal with uh, climate issue, climate catastrophe. And as you know, as a vegan, I also deal with uh, animal rights. So uh, I'm looking forward to your questions because I will be very happy to ask uh, all the detailed questions. Uh, what is uh, here the situation in European Parliament? How is to be uh, a woman in the European Parliament, uh, a fresh politician in the European Parliament? Uh, because a lot of uh, male politicians uh, have been here for many years for many terms and this is my first ter term and I have a lot of uh, experiences, a lot of impressions, so just ask me questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can write already your questions uh, in the chat. Um, if there are any. Okay, I will use this opportunity uh, as a moderator and ask you my first question. So you are coming from a country that had um, really shocking, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> shocking changes uh, recently. So how, what is the reaction of uh, MEPs to this situation in Poland? It's uh, one of the rare EU countries uh, that are uh, that has this in legislation on on agenda of the legislations the abortion issues. So, what was the reaction of uh, European Parliament in general? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I think that uh, Poland is uh, a country where two main areas of fundamental women's rights are violated. Uh, the first area is violence against women, including domestic violence and sexual violence. And the second area are the productive rights of women, the right to an access to abortion, contraceptives, sexual education. And maybe you will be surprised but uh, I need to say that there was no government in Poland that was really uh, in favor of women's rights. And if you are talking about current, this recent changes uh, of anti-abortion law and this so-called ruling of so-called constitutional tribunal. You are probably aware of uh, all these controversies about the rule of law concerning constitutional tribunal in Poland. You can clearly see that constitutional tribunal, uh, it's not the first ruling of this kind. The first ruling of constitutional tribunal against uh, uh, women's access to abortion uh, was uh, decided, was adopted in uh, 1997. The second one was adopted in 2015. So this is the third ruling that uh, in, in fact limits uh, the rights of women and no wonder that uh, 
so many people are now on the streets protesting against such a law, such a ruling, such a policy of the ruling party. And uh, now in the European Parliament, we are preparing a draft of, re of the resolution that could be adopted uh, in the period of time of 16 days of activism against violence against women. Because this kind of violations uh, of women, uh, women's rights is a systemic state violence against women's rights, against women. And I'm really happy that we can adopt such a resolution uh, in two weeks' time when these 16 days are started. Uh, of twenty uh, fifth of November, uh, as as uh, every year, and I also prepared a draft of the letter to the ruling party, to the government, to the president of uh, the Republic of Poland, uh, concerning uh, the uh, the attitudes uh, the government presents towards protesters. Uh, we appeal uh, to, we call uh, upon the government to uh, have a good dialogue, uh, not to have this so-called compromise of women's rights. And there are more than 80 MEPs that co-signed this letter to the government uh, today. And I also prepared a written question to the Commission, to the European Commission. I asked the uh, European Commission about its uh, perspective. What about violations of the rule of law, which is also a violation of fundamental reproductive women's rights? Whether the Commission uh, is obliged to react for such situation? Because uh, the rule of law is not only independence of judiciary, freedom of media, but also about fundamental human rights, women's rights, LGBTI rights, uh, people with disabilities rights. But for now, unfortunately, European Commission ignores such situation. Uh, and. Uh, European Parliament uh, uh, reacts quite opposite in such situation. We adopted a lot of resolutions concerning Poland and someone could ask the question, is it worth it? Does it make sense? Yes, because, uh, you know, every such resolution has its impact shows solidarity with uh, citizens of Poland, women and men who now are on the streets. So yes, uh, it does make sense. Thank you so much for the reply. Yeah, it's a bit scary to see that this is still a question uh, for many, but yeah, still, uh, that there are so many uh, mechanisms to uh, work around it and maybe also that's a reason for more women to run for politics and uh, uh, vote for uh, better laws for all of us. Okay, I will give now word to Justine and we have some questions already in the chat but uh, we will answer them after Justine finishes and also you can maybe write whom you are directing the question. If you don't write it, we will ask this question to both um, panelists. Justine, go ahead. Yeah, hey, now I have a small presentation just to have some visual aids. Um, yeah, you see my screen, right? Okay, cool. First of all, I wanted to congratulate uh, Sylvia uh, on your new task in, on, on the European level. And, and I think it's interesting, first of all, to have both of us, at, like it's a European level and then local level, because I think in, in both ways, it tends to be sometimes that uh, these levels are more progressive than national level. Uh, which is absurd uh, on, a, on a 
on one aspect, but uh, I am glad that we're representing these kind of uh, two uh, levels that uh, can have major impacts. And on the other note, I wanted to just mention that uh, there is happening uh, um, street action, a protest uh, in front of Polish Embassy in Riga right now, uh, and I would be there, uh, but I'm here now uh, to support uh, the um, Polish uh, women and activists uh, in, in this kind of um, terrifying uh, times. Um, yeah, so I'll just briefly we'll talk about um, uh, some background uh, just for people uh, to understand uh, the, yeah, the situation, why I, my reasoning behind some of the things. And, uh, Latvia's story is not uh, indifferent to uh, love uh, post-Soviet countries, and I think we share a lot of um, uh, similarities in politics and social dynamic in the Eastern Europe. Um, and we have, I've, like, uh, our independence is quite, quite, quite a new one, and uh, it was built on the idea of being free, uh, and it lacked kind of an idea of where we want to be in, in values. So the freedom itself was the main idea uh, and driver. Uh, but when we gained that independence, uh, we were just as uh, a lot of Eastern European countries drawn to like free market uh, and capitalist society, which really kind of uh, has impacted us, us a lot. Um, uh, and at the same time, we can see that there's still strong this post-Soviet kind of or Soviet kind of mentality embedded in political and social culture. Um, we do see it, it's a generational gap. Um, you can see the um, more progressive side being more younger and it's pro-European. Uh, and then we have uh, this whole generation that has been ha had grown up in the Soviet times and that really impacts how they see uh, and reflect politics and how politics uh, are uh, a topic within each other in our society. And uh, this is not something new, but oligarchy and politics is business as usual is something that uh, is still uh, re uh, dominating uh, Latvian politics a lot and uh, driving uh, polarization uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in Latvian politics. And I think oligarchy uh, is rather uh, dying down uh, or the main oligarchs are, are um, not as popular. Now they're uh, populists on the right uh, and populists in general taking their kind of share in political scene. And what is also so important to know that the political divide and national identities uh, is how we see uh, Lat uh, Latvian politics. So Latvian um, parties versus uh, Russian parties uh, that is not based on values, it's based on national nationalities, uh, which creates again a big divide. Um, and the, and I like in, if we come to myself, I really never wanted to be in politics, but I wanted to change the world. And you know, you, it, the um, uh, cognitive dissonance of this sentence uh, is where I'm at now. Uh, I would say uh, I, I saw politics as um, as a environment where you where uh, it's men. It's mostly men, middle aged. Uh, oligarchs, uh, corruption-based uh, business as usual. So if we don't, if we see, uh, if we don't see someone who represents us um, in, in our values, in our identities, then we cannot see ourselves being part of that environment or we do not want to participate actively. And, uh, nevertheless, uh, and I think uh, what Sylvia said also really resonated with me. Uh, I'm a uh, uh, a specialist uh, on like urban planning or an activist and you can do as much as you can until a certain level and then you have to take that leap uh, to the political um, side um, in order to to actively change things but it's a big leap and it's a big gap and I think our Eastern European perspective has created this gap uh, and for, especially for young people not to take it and not to have take the leap uh, onto the political level uh, but how I ended up here, um, 
uh, in 2016, it, it's interesting that like because now we see um, the state United States uh, going through elections. Um, I was thinking, what was what was I doing four years ago? And I was under, and I realized I was uh, finishing up my master's. I was doing Erasmus uh, internship in Barcelona, and uh, I was nowhere near politics. So like from being a local uh, counselor to like four years ago, which seems like just one breath of air uh, in political terms, um, I was nowhere near there. And I remember how um, weird that was and, and shockingly to me personally to see uh, not only, uh, okay, we cannot talk about how Hillary Clinton as only a female, uh, female um, politician. Nevertheless, we saw what uh, what are the uh, ceilings for female uh, pol politicians in uh, top positions, uh, especially the rhetoric uh, going against uh, female pol politician. Um, and I couldn't believe that uh, populism, uh, racism, uh, bigotry on this level can win uh, on such a um, big uh, scale. And um, I... Um, even though it was 2016, I, there was like few main points that uh, got me to the first political step I did I was joining a party. I did that two years after in 2018. And what uh, two things that I can say that really inspired me and motivated me was activism in Eastern, European, Eastern Europe. Um, uh, already at that time in 2016, uh, 2017, I joined uh, CDN, and I was, and I'm still, I'm part of uh, alternative organization working group, which uh, gave me this opportunity to meet so many young um, activists from all Eastern Europe and see that the struggles they're facing are, uh, on so many levels, harsher than uh, I'm seeing uh, in Latvia, and that gave me a bit of perspective that. Uh, if they can do it, why can't I do it? Um, and then uh, the second part was that for the first time uh, in Latvia, um, a po political party that was based on uh, values, um, we, like um, established itself. It was around 2017, I think. Um, and they are uh, like progressives are the social democratic green party that uh, reflects on LGBT rights, the climate rights, uh, workers' rights, and, and doesn't, um, uh, doesn't look on the national, nationality as pol pol politics. You know, we, we do not stand against Russians or Latvians. We are um, focusing on, on merging and not dividing people like that. And uh, this one thing that, like, one thing I was afraid of is was just joining politics in general, uh, as I didn't see that as an environment I want to be personally. But the second thing was that uh, I, at that time I uh, was started, I had already started working in a local municipality in uh, Riga City Development Department. So uh, the background of Riga at that time we had quite corrupt uh, mayor and uh, i was personally afraid of being uh, um, a retribution in my workspace if i joined a political party it's still we don't in latvian like in eastern europe uh, we don't uh, there's not a lot of uh, political a activism uh, in uh, being part of political uh, parties so for me it was quite i, I was wondering uh, I had this fear of what will become of my uh, career if I joined the political party. Uh, but nevertheless, I did fill um, the uh, curie or, uh, to, to become a member of the paperwork and uh, really nothing happened because all my fears of love like bigger than, uh, uh, than um, what reality was. Um, Mm, one thing that uh, um, I can note is that um, be, being part of the political party, it can depend on uh, your activity. You can be a passive member, you can be a super active one. So it does, it's, it's one step to join political party, which is, which is uh, amazing. 
uh, but to be an active member and to uh, run in a, in an election is the second leap you have to take in order to if you want if you believe enough of your in yourself and uh, your uh, power to change uh, and be part of the politics that's also some that's more uh, again believing in yourself and in your voice uh, is something uh, I was also really uh, not sure I can do it right um, I knew uh, I knew that I, uh, on the topic uh, I was really good I knew uh, for urban planning I was working for the city but running publicly running and saying these ambitions out loud and as a young woman is quite challenging in itself but um, uh, we the, uh, the uh, snap elections we had in Riga for the local elections uh, there are a few things that was I have to note um, that really impacts uh, impacted me. We uh, we were um, a team of like-minded people with the same values. So I wasn't the only woman. Uh, there were also queer people on the list. Uh, we were uh, progressives from plus um, two thirds of liberals. Uh, we were joining. We joined. Uh, collectively with the only kind of left uh, political party uh, in hopes to change things in Riga. And there are a lot of uh, young uh, professionals as well. So the atmosphere and the local kind of group um, all, all, also always matters you know, because you're not running like elections is from one side um, re really independent thing you do, but at the same time it's a group work and if you don't have the support and if you, you're not working as a team, um, it's really hard to do or achieve anything. So, and believing in, in yourself and seeing that like they're like-minded and um, like-minded people around you um, makes the whole, uh, whole of different um, game. And another thing that was really hard, it was that um, the, the snap elections that was supposed to happen in February uh, actually happened only in August due to a uh, few things, but it was a campaign of eight months, which is uh, crazy for ele local elections, uh, especially for people like I was working full time simultaneously. Um, I, I uh, campaigned on, on two things. Uh, I campaigned on climate change aspect and uh, climate action and youth's uh, role in urban planning and city development and these are these were the things that um, were really resonating for me they're really true for me and that's also something you cannot run um, just only based on what's good as a topic or what you are able to sell it has to be true for you because People feel, uh, people want to have new kind of politics, politicians who are actually genuinely passionate about things, who have gone through, uh, who have experience and are bringing that experience to the table. Uh, and uh, we had quite, um, quite amazing turnout. We won the elections, our uh, combined uh, list. So we were we won with 26 percent, which gave us uh, 18 votes um, in uh, uh, 18 votes. No, 18 people altogether uh, got elected, and eight, 11 of them were um, progressives and uh, progressive candidates. Uh, and nine of our 11 people are younger than 40. We are um, coming from different perspectives. Uh, um, uh, different uh, professional perspectives, different age. We are, uh, most of our um, progressives are women. So I think we have seven out of 11 are women. Uh, we have the youngest people uh, in local elections. It's uh, from our, uh, from progressives, me and Edmonds, who is a co-chairperson uh, of progressives. Uh, we have Latvian, Latvian speaking and uh, Russian speaking uh, politicians um, and for a state council with a disability. And I take this, this is really why I'm emphasizing is that um, you can, 
the change comes from uh, the first steps, like even putting which people are you putting on the list matters dramatically. And I, I'm so super proud that our elected members really uh, represent that. So the diversity uh, the city faces sees is reflected in our um, faction uh, in, uh, in this um, local council. And what can I say to kind of um, inspire you? Um, I, I, uh, AOC uh, has this amazing uh, video in the support of the 2020 election, let these frustrations um, radicalize you. Uh, I think we're all scared a lot about uh, our democracies and sometimes it feels that it, it's going down and it's becoming even worse. And I would encourage to all you, to you um, to turn this fear into action uh, because it's now time to to act and and be on the streets and uh, take the next step if you want to to uh, to run and to be the change you want to see. It's scary. It's it will be scary uh, before you decide. It will be scary after uh, you decide after in the campaign in the running. If you get elected, it will be even more scarier because then you actually have the uh, mandate and um, the, uh, all eyes will be on you and your decisions. Uh, but we have to, um, there is no other way um, to see our democracy is live another day uh, if we don't uh, become more active and stand in front of the fear that we see and sharing fear and turning into the action uh, creates, um, creates change. Uh, and, and few things that um, I can take from my little experience uh, in politics, um, I, st I also don't see myself as a politician but rather an activist uh, doing politics. Um, find your voice and I mean find it through the topics that make you burn or make you angry. Uh, the topics that you uh, talk about uh, at parties uh, with your friends and everyone's tired of, that's, that's, th those are your topics that you have to bring uh, on, on, on your political game. Um, because finding your voice also makes you more confident and more confident in your ability to change things. It's also, I think, important to evaluate it from the time to time um, and adjust it uh, if it's not working, but never doubt your strengths and inner voice and the values uh, you see. Um, and I can't stress it enough. Uh, we, uh, everywhere in Europe, uh, in Eastern Europe, we need new kind of politics and uh, bringing that to the table, your um, uh, your youthfulness, uh, you being uh, queer, female, non-male, is your strength. And bringing that perspective into conversations on the political table might not be uh, um, I don't know, comfortable at times, and you might still feel isolated. Uh, but it's super important that we do that because the uh, decisions we make afterwards uh, are ultimately better. And find your allies and friends uh, and ask for help if you need it. The Green family, I think, in Eastern Europe and in Europe is super good um, uh, network to use. Uh, first of all, a lot of friends, a lot of people uh, who have gone through uh, a lot of uh, these uh, political steps might give you just a good conversation to talk about. Um, but at the same time, ask for help, ask for um, uh, endorsements. Um, we also did that uh, in progressives. So, so the Green, European Greens endorsed uh, us as a list and um, came on spot and Duck uh, personally endorsed me. And I think that helped a lot, not only for me to feel, um, sometimes these encouragements feel, make you feel like you deserve and you, you can do it. Um, but at the same time, it also matters um, as a, as a way to establish your candidacy 
to the um, electorate as well. Uh, campaigning is super hard. Uh, campaigning in a um, conservative environment uh, on social media um, uh, age is super hard. It, it might be dominated by uh, nasty comments um, and uh, you might feel uh, like you don't deserve anything and you can do it uh, at times, but that's what you go, that's, that's some, something you have to just get through it. Um, and but it's super worth it and it's worth it to make your campaign based on um, make it more inclusive um, make it with um, other green young politicians other green activists um, because again politics are sometimes really individualized but uh, I, we have to turn it into kind of um, that group work let's say but uh, a teamwork because we are running as as um, as a team as people who are um, want, wanting to bring the change because ultimately if you don't get elected some other person might be and they're your uh, ally uh, on you, there will be you you'll be their ally in uh, helping them to make the change and uh, just to finish it up, I wanted to, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really love AOC and uh, I tried not to overuse it, but I really I'm, I have thought about this a lot. As, uh, this is uh, uh, aspire to a mission, <laughs> not a position. <laughs> this is um, um, always read when you do uh, presentations beforehand, but uh, yeah, I aspire to a mission, not a position. And uh, mission is is something we all do as activists, and politics might be just a tool to achieve it. And never focus on uh, this or that position. Um, it's always about how you make the biggest change uh, to most people, uh, and that kind of. Uh, if you, if you don't feel like uh, politics is for you, and, and, and I understand that, you might go through, uh, still do everything you can as an activist. Uh, and I think a lot of ac activism is purely based on mission, mission uh, based knowledge or understanding. And, uh, and help that guide your um, decisions and uh, in, in order to change um, your, either local city council, um, national level, or, or, uh, or European level, or yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Justina, for so many uh, points for thinking. Indeed, uh, we can try to do our activism, and you said also that you were like avoiding becoming a member of party but yeah politics is everywhere and uh, if you don't do politics then you're just accepting what uh, other side are deciding uh, for you um, I have some other points to maybe talk about later and uh, go deeper and philosophical but uh, let's first answer the questions uh, from the chat uh, how does general public perceive women in high places in politics? Maybe Sylvia, you can talk about the European Parliament and Justine, you can talk about the City Council of Riga. Um, and I think uh, uh, the, the image uh, of uh, women in politics uh, uh, reflects uh, the role and perception of the role uh, of women in general uh, in life uh, and uh, private and family life. And um, uh, of course, all women that are not uh, married, that are not, that don't have children, are suspects suspects of all um, controversial uh, things uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, it also uh, the language also shows how we treat women in politics, uh, in public life, in professional life. Uh, as you said at the beginning, um, I am a holder of a PhD in law. So in the uh, in this uh, terminology of uh, Western countries, I'm a Professor Spurek. But nobody calls me uh, Professor Spurek, obviously. Uh, a lot of people call me Miss Sylvia or Miss Spurek. Uh, I'm also attorney at law. Um, I am also a former deputy uh, commissioner for human rights. And Sometimes I, um, uh, I wonder uh, whether if I was a man, uh, if I were a man, uh, uh, somebody uh, would call me uh, Minister Spurek because this is uh, this terminology of uh, uh, Commissioner for Human Rights in Poland. This is like uh, this, this level of minister constitutional minister, uh, although this is an independent uh, authority, obviously. Uh, but nobody, nobody calls me uh, Madam Minister. Um, and um, maybe if I, uh, if I were older than I am, I'm 44, uh, maybe if I'm not, uh, if I were not a, a woman, uh, with long hair, who knows? Uh, but uh, but of course, I uh, um, yeah, seriously speaking, I I uh, try to focus on uh, the issue I've been dealing with, uh, on the solutions, on my tools I have as an MEP in the European Parliament. So I. Uh, uh, I, I uh, conduct uh, uh, two, uh, two uh, very uh, huge and important programs, uh, which is uh, uh, 16 days of activism against violence against women, just in uh, three weeks, and uh, starting in, in three weeks, and uh, free from industrial farming. Uh, which will be dedicated to people living in a neighborhood of industrial animal uh, farms, uh, not only in Poland, but also other member states of the European Union. Uh, I, uh, I, I uh, ask questions, written questions, oral questions to the uh, European Commission. I prepare speeches, uh, I prepare a written statements, uh, uh, I lobby, I, uh, I, I use advocacy tools, uh, so uh, I'm not focusing um, what people, how people see me. Uh, I, um, I, I'm focusing on how to be uh, really efficient even though I'm a woman. Wow, thank you. A uh, very inspiring point. Uh, are you still there? Yeah, um, so you're answering the question Maya has, right? Um, yeah, so I think in general it's um, hard still for women to be in politics because the environment is sexist, uh, conservative, and it's really because it's beneficial to the status quo, right? Um, uh, it's changing. In national parliament, we have uh, the, this uh, parliament has 33% women, which is the um, the highest number uh, in history. So it's yay, 33%, and it's the highest amount of women in the parliament. Um, it's similar in local uh, council, the same more or less, um, and it's really reflects on how we see women, right, um, and how we, um, whether we think they're capable of being in, uh, in top positions. Uh, that's one part. Uh, and second part, uh, being especially young uh, is, um, is an aspect that we I kind of have to deal with, but be 
for me it's a bit easier as I've been part of like this topic is really mine I uh, I've worked as a normal planner so I know actually like I'm professionally really good <laughs> yeah, in, in on topics um, so I don't have such, such a learning curve which would make my life uh, much harder as a young politician uh, whereas a young politician may young male politician with the same learning curve would have different um, um, different environment and different kind of um, reception um, and in general like our country is run by uh, males um, and uh, we have few females and they're usually scrutinized on so many more levels um, child care um, how you dress how you look uh, it's an additional always something we have to think and uh, and take into consideration and uh, the other thing like uh, after we were uh, sworn we were not sworn in but after the first city council meeting uh there wasn't uh in uh, um how it's called uh, yellow press or just like uh in media um discussed how uh young uh, local councillor female councillors were dressed to the first um council um, and I was described as a young student coming from a uh, um, shashlik uh, party, uh, which is really <laughs> funny. I, um, because I had a t-shirt, uh, which was a political t-shirt and a jacket and etc. Uh, but it's, it was really funny for me because everything uh, I wore that day was uh, kind of, I, was, I had thought about it. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, it, 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 and no, no male was uh, also scrutinized in the same way. Uh, that's just a background noise, I would, uh, I would say. Um, but especially since the outer environment is so toxic, I would say political environment is toxic, it's really important that you, the inner dynamic within your party uh, is uh, green, inclusive, uh, feminist. Uh, and you have to cherish if your home, let's say political home, uh, is not, um, uh, doesn't have the standards or principles, then you will not uh, survive uh, in, in kind of this toxic political environment. And the second part, uh, do we answer the second question as well? About. Mm. Uh, yeah, I can read it out so everybody knows also those who watch us on Facebook. Uh, thank you, by the way, for your reply. It's actually very good and um, I think very practical idea to ensure that the party is so supportive and you really surround yourself with people who you know that will support you in this kind of situation when you uh, jump into the pool of uh, toxic politics, as you said. Okay, second question is, uh, usually activists go to politics for reasons you also mentioned in the beginning. Can you draw a parallel between the activist work and political work? Whoever wants to go first. Um, okay, I will start um, just a brief. Um, uh, it, I mean, it's kind of the same because you have to lobby things as well and you have to make um, connections uh, and uh, um, like have connections with people from other parties. It's a personal one, you know, it's the same. You kind of, if you want to lobby things, sometimes you have to know the right people. Um, but it's completely different from the perspective that uh, as an activist you fight against the system but when you're a politician you are in the system so you have to different kind of ball game and when you're in the system you have more tools to fight within um, within it um, yes and that's kind of you have to understand you have to switch it like when you you have to understand the power you kind of have and the tools adjust your tools uh, and you have to come from this kind of power position whereas as an activist you're always kind of fighting against it against this um, status quo who what is generalized uh, as, as politics that's my uh, in two sentences 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sylvia. Dr. Sporek, sorry. <laughs> I felt embarrassed when you said it. <laughs> No, but uh, I think uh, the majority of people that uh, ignore uh, my uh, biography note are actually elderly men, uh, not uh, young uh, or uh, uh, older female experts. So, uh, so it's not the case. Uh, but uh, I think. I cannot indicate a huge difference between um, activism and politics, uh, between being an activist and being a politician, actually. I still feel I, I'm even more activist than an expert now, because I need to be very uh, dedicated, uh, meet a lot of people, create uh, networks uh, and coalitions, um, uh, go uh, on the streets. Uh, so, so maybe for for people who think that politics is uh, uh, business as usual, uh, is dirty, is uh, uh, useless um, is uh, old men's club. Uh, we can say that um, uh, politics uh, is about activism. So all these people from uh, climate strikes um, who who deal with uh, LGBTI rights, please, you are welcome in politics. Thank you. Yeah, maybe it's more of a, like there are a bit different aims, but you do the same kind of procedures, both in activism and politics. And yes, indeed, maybe we, we should have more activists in politics. So people don't stop only on protesting, but um, also then uh, vote for the laws. Okay. Um, you can write more questions in the chats and I have some other questions. I wanted to ask you to tell us um, if there was any like fun story from your experience of running for the latest elections that you remember and uh, it was curious in one or another way. Uh, something maybe challenging from what you can give also recommendations to our participants of the online course and everyone who is watching um, how to behave in particular situation. Maybe I, 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 I will not tell uh, a funny story. I, uh, I will tell you uh, something about what is the most important the end of the day. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the solidarity you gain from uh, the closest uh, uh, colleagues, but from your family mostly, is the most important. My sister uh, that uh, lives in Italy uh, left uh, her job for one month and came uh, to Poland uh, to support me in the campaign, in the election campaign last year. He spent, uh, she spent uh, a whole month uh, working with me, for me, and organizing the whole campaign from 6 a.m. till 2 a.m. Uh, we spent, we, we were spending 24 uh, seven uh, all this month uh, and uh, she's the most important person for me and I wish you all you have such a sister or brother and this is also about feminism and sisterhood this is 
real sisterhood, this is real sol solidarity, this is a uh, real support you can gain from another woman uh, who help you, who helps you with, uh, with the election. And thanks to my Anya, I won the election. Wow. Uh, you are really lucky to have <laughs> such sister and yeah, let's hope everyone has biological or not biological sister who would uh, do the same. Justina? Yeah, well, I don't have any uh, kind of uh, close siblings uh, could help me out like that. So, um, but I had um, people who helped me from protest, which is a youth uh, NGO that uh, um, I was one of the people who established it. So, I mean, that's why I um, told previously, right? It's about friends and allies. It's not only about family included, but not only, not um, not, not restricted to. And it's, uh, it's important for you to, yeah, you cannot make any kind of change alone and I think that's the main uh, kind of um, out outcome or just like an uh, yeah, idea for me. Um, it's either in campaign, you cannot campaign on your own, you'll just like uh, go crazy because it's a lot of pressure, it's long working hours and there are a lot of uh, you don't, like, things that come up and uh, you have to uh, react to it. and. Uh, and and so you have to make you have to find a team whatever kind of team it's within the other uh, com, com, people who are campaigning and for me we did that on uh, local elections so we were kind of uh more yeah a few people who did more things together um more videos uh some videos uh going uh, on streets to campaign together and that support matters a lot um but um, I don't know, like, if there's some kind of curious case of campaigning. Um, but I think one thing, one thing was that, uh, like, for young, um, young uh, outsider coming in, you have, like, on one hand, you don't have love lose. You're not, you're not the incumbent. You have, did you have to, or you have your own, your own political. I know uh, persona that you have to uh, continue fulfilling. So you can do a bit extra stuff. You can be more creative. You can uh, be more outspoken because, like, worst thing, you just don't get elected. Uh, so be more extra crazy. Uh, we did this uh, kind of get out to vote uh, video with uh, my phone, uh, and it was uh, really well shared on social media where we did like funny things. I was uh, popping out of um, a flower bed and, and uh, we were hugging trees and uh, talking how we should be more inclusive in the place where uh, people um, start the pride we have once in three years. You know, these are things you can do in these kind of... Um, more non-formal uh, or uh, yeah, less formal ways how to talk or, uh, or approach um, people. And that's more, I think, more challenge yourself. Uh, or one in my um, campaign videos, which also was shot by with my phone. I uh, was rolling or sitting on a skate skateboard uh, because I cannot uh, really skate uh, and. Uh, talk about, uh, and I was just rolling in and uh, talking about uh, how we need more uh, spaces that is uh, dedicated to young people and uh, yeah, stuff like that, uh, that was really interesting to do and but which was really fun at the same time to do in this stressful campaign. Thank you. Since we are talking about the teams and inclusion, I also wanted to ask you, uh, because you mentioned Justine and that uh, you had a lot of uh, women, queer people, young people uh, on the list in the elections. So uh, was it like natural uh, thing that this list uh, was so rich, let's say? Uh, or uh, was there some strategy behind it and you were sitting with the team and coming up, okay, we should uh, put more people that are queer and so on on the list? 
Yeah, so with progressives, uh, the general idea is to uh, positively discriminate against minorities. <laughs> so um, it's more towards um, women um, rather than LGBT because it's more rather sensitive that so many people are out. Um, so what we do is always try to um, balance, so 50-50 um, in our um, lists. Uh, we did that on the national le national elections um, two years ago. Um, every list, so we have regional lists for the national parliament, uh, five lists altogether, and every, all lists were headed by our, our women. So there is no other political party that did that. Uh, and so for for uh, local elections, there are also a set of criteria. On one was to uh, um, demonstrate that we have to strive for 50-50 um, uh, representation um, and that matters a lot. Thank you so much and we can have another question. Is it true in your work experience that women in politics are pressured by society to work on feminist slash female relevant topics? So I would separate them because yeah, what, what is relevant for females, it's, I guess, pretty broad topic depending on women. <laughs> so yeah, as you interpret the question, you can reply on it, whoever wants to go first. Uh, okay. Um, um, first of all, I think that uh, If you are a uh, pro, if you are a professional uh, politician, you would like to deal with issues you feel you are expert on, not all different kinds of issues. And uh, when we uh, see some TV shows, um, uh, radio, podcasts, uh, and so on, uh, the majority of experts are men. Because, and this is the, uh, the, 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 the opinion of, uh, of uh, journalists uh, themselves, uh, women don't agree to go to, to the program and talk about all uh, different kinds of issues. Uh, if I am an expert of uh, the climate, I would like to talk about the climate, the climate issues, the climate catastrophe, the climate changes, not about uh, defense uh, problems or uh, healthcare problems, uh, vaccines problems. It's not my uh, area of expertise. Uh, and uh, I think and this is the second point of view, um, I think women enter the politics to change the world in some uh, uh, particular areas um, and a lot of women actually uh, have this expertise on uh, on child care, on some local problems of their communities, on education, because the steel, the women uh, are put into this uh, child care, education, um, uh, care over the um, elderly parents' uh, issues and so on. Uh, so it is like a vicious circle uh, somehow, but um, uh, more and more women uh, deal with uh, uh, areas and issues uh, that are not uh, connected with this uh, stereotype female problems. And this is good. And, um, and we need, of course, first of all, more women in politics, uh, but also more women that are not experts on education, child care, work-life balance, uh, uh, women's rights, uh, of course, I'm an expert on women's rights, so it's not. Uh, it's also an 
uh, appeal towards me, but um, uh, but uh, but we we need more women in politics, more different women uh, in politics, more uh, traditional thinking women, more progressive women, uh, all kinds of women, because we need we need a critical mass to show uh, the public that women. Uh, are also in politics uh, and uh, and and they they want to be uh, in politics sometimes they are not in politi in politics because uh, they cannot be in politics they uh, don't know how to do this but they want to and not all men and not all women want to be in politics but the mechanisms are quite the same. Uh, we all need tools. We all need uh, knowledge. Uh, we all need some support uh, in work-life balance. Because if we would like men uh, to be real fathers, real husbands, uh, real partners, they also need work-life balance uh, uh, tools. Thank you so <clears throat> sorry thank you so much um actually i have one more additional uh, clarification maybe uh because you were mentioning that also it's good to have more conservative or traditional thinking women in politics as i know there are there are a lot of women in european parliament and it's variety of parties from totally right wing to very very left wing parties so would you say that uh, having even conservative and uh, traditional, let's say, or uh, right-wing women is better in politics than uh, have men from the same party? I know it might differ individually, but is there a point of having uh, women who are still right-wing and don't agree with us on many things? Uh, because we also talked about pink washing and these quotas and Marine Le Pen and uh, uh, so on. So, yeah, what do you think about this? Uh, is it still better to have right-wing women in parliament or right-wing men? Um, probably I'm not a good uh, person to answer this question because as a feminist, uh, I think that we need to support every woman. Uh, in politics and we need to support her to be a politician but we need to support her also for example in the situation uh, she's a victim of cyber violence uh, of violence in internet we all are such victims and we know uh, how it is to be a victim of uh, cyber violence uh, being a woman because it's totally different a uh, story. Uh, you know, this hate speech in internet is totally different uh, against men, uh, and hate speech against uh, women. Women, uh, women is uh, is totally different. And um, I um, I decided many years ago uh, not to uh, attack uh, a woman. Uh, an expert, politician, a journalist, uh, if uh, the position of uh, her party, of her group uh, is not acceptable, I always try to find a man uh, to question him and to question his statement, uh, his behavior, uh, his explanation of the statement, instead of questioning uh, this this uh, this woman, and of course I can see that uh, it doesn't work this way uh, towards me. Uh, many conservative women uh, attack me uh, in the European Parliament, in in Poland, uh, but. Mm, but I always, uh, I always uh, uh, tell myself that we are on the same, we are in the same situation. Actually, uh, we face the same uh, barriers. We, you, we face the same stereotypes concerning gender uh, roles, 
And my duty as a feminist, maybe it sounds uh, funny, but my duty as a feminist is to support such women, um, maybe not, maybe not no matter what, but at least um, try to understand her. Thank you so much. Yeah, indeed, uh, good strategy and yeah, better than attacking. It's always like try. It's better to try to support the other and even uh, yeah. I I don't think that it might make a lot of sense to talk to super right wing men, but yeah, your strategy is very very good to shift the to balance out this. Uh, questioning and uh, believing in people. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. I also want to contribute to this question. Okay, okay. you can <laughs> get, give us the uh, uh, perspective. Sorry. But not only rig perspective, of uh, other feminist um, female perspective. Um, yeah, from one perspective, I, uh, from one side, I agree with Sulia. From other part, uh, we need feminist female or male politicians in general and we have to hold everyone um, against a like bare minimum standard right and we can I think Amy Coney Barrett um, in uh, US in the Supreme Court case is really good case where we talk about female in a leading position from one of the most important places in their democracy and she is anti-feminist and she's not um, her agenda is uh, to decrease uh, women's um, liberties. So from this perspective, we cannot just tell, okay, yeah, she's, she's, she is, uh, yes, I can, we can say that she's a female and she is loved, um, she's, she is facing all the same barriers, but at the same time, her politics is making other women anywhere um, having facing more um, obstacles in their lifetime uh, and probably you know, being part of um, full members of society. So I think um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough subject and it, it's not, there's not right or wrong and we have to from one side encourage all female, females from all political backgrounds to be part of um, uh, conversation and in order for have an equal society to have equal uh, opportunities for male or female in, in politics or, or, or non-males, uh, but at the same time we have to hold our standards um, for those politicians as well. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so I just want to ask you the last question to like wrap it up a bit because uh, we are doing this webinar also mostly for our participants that are supposed to do some local actions in December and January and yeah every day day by day we feel that situation is getting worse and worse and yeah it's a bit difficult to uh, stay motivated and stay inspired and uh, yeah do the activity be it daily activism or more long term some political action so maybe you could just say some last uh, inspiring words uh, from your perspective uh, why should these people still continue fighting what they're fighting for and couple of recommendations and yeah that would be our webinar for today whoever wants to go first well i can start uh, as i already kind of um, highlighted some of these things um yeah i mean from one side we can see state-led oppressions in uh, europe um, as a continent but at the same time, what inspires me is to see people um, coming together and fighting it uh, in a really tough um, environment uh, from week to week. And you're like, and that really shows that you're not alone and we are not alone. Or uh, even the state, if the state are pushing their agenda, um, it's not 
supported by the majority. And it's especially important for, for you to make these connections, uh, to find more like-minded people, because that's how you, firstly, per on a personal level, you um, validate your ideas and you um, get confidence that you're not alone. And the second uh, part is that you, that's how you bring change and motivate each other and do more action. So find at least one person who has the same energy and thinks the same. And that's why uh, youth and organizations uh, especially are super important as their kind of first barrier platform, a barrier but a platform um, for you to strengthen your ideas. Um, and uh, I don't know, really, like we live in weird times. This, like this dec decade in the last five years at least, it's, it, it will not get better for a while. Uh, but take, uh, and don't, maybe don't read news. Uh, there's this really amazing economist, Grace Blakely, um, check, it, check her out. And she says uh, uh, that uh, you shouldn't read the news because firstly, uh, it changes so in such a speed. And second of all, it really, like nothing really, um, it, it doesn't, uh, nothing major happens, right? It's not some small news happening, but it's, the not major shifts in society will be you will be seen on the news. So just like take yourself a bit out of it and focus on the big big picture and the big like um, scale um, processes. Um, and uh, yeah, and try to uh, take care of yourself uh, mentally as well. Uh, we have to talk about the, how demanding it is to be an activist, how demanding it is to be a politician, a female non male uh, politician and uh, really draw some lines where you work, where you uh, find your mental game, mental space, whether it's uh, going on the walks, uh, but don't uh, push yourself, even though like the fight will never end. There is always will be some campaign, some uh, tasks, some action, but uh, it's okay not to do everything, prioritize and uh, focus. Thank you so much. Yeah, indeed, we won't be able, like one person is not able to solve everything, but together we will solve maybe a lot of stuff. Sylvia Spurek, Dr. Sylvia Spurek, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I think sometimes I'm, I'm talking about uh, our well-being uh, in general, uh, men and women. Uh, sometimes we are so focused uh, on demonstrations, on protesting, on um, preparing petitions, uh, that we, uh, we can um, forget uh, what the cause, this good cause is, especially when we are under attacked uh, in social media, uh, all these private messages, all these uh, hate speech comments uh, in Facebook, in Twitter, uh, could really affect uh, our, um, how we see the reality and, and, uh, uh, and the world around us. And what is important to meet even remotely, people who share our values. And not to forget uh, what the values are and why are we doing this. Because, you know, in Poland, there are so many activists on the streets and they have been on the streets for five years now. And they are really sick and tired, tired of being on the street, tired, tired of, be, of being called, tired of being accused, they have criminal proceedings. And, um, and it's really uh, difficult for them. Uh, and that's why all these activists uh, should not forget about themselves, about uh, self-caring, uh, about well-being, about good sleep, good, uh, good food, meeting friends, meeting family, 
to have some balance uh, in this very demanding uh, times because it's so easy now for them to uh, to feel that they are alone you are not alone we see you we feel you are suffering we uh, appreciate your engagement uh, we support you european parliament support you supports you uh, european union supports you a lot of people support you and you know sometimes when i don't read all this hate speech uh, in my internet but but uh, sometimes i need to comment on something and uh, and all of a sudden i get a message from a woman or a man who is writing uh, i'm observing uh, your facebook i'm observing your actions you are doing a great things keep doing this i don't comment on your facebook but it doesn't mean i can see what you are doing thank you for that and there are so many people who think this way towards our actions they sometimes they are sometimes silent it's not very good to be silent at these times but a lot of people are silent uh, but it doesn't mean they don't support us. They don't support you. We are really supported but, but by a, a huge number of people. We cannot even imagine uh, how big this, this group is. So, uh, go vegan, obviously, <laughs> because it's really important for climate, for people and for animals. And of course, this is serious, but seriously speaking, uh, keep doing what you are doing and don't, um, don't be afraid because um, the sky is the limit. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Big, big thanks for coming tonight uh, and yeah I think this video will stay to inspire upcoming generations um, of CDN um, yeah uh, I wanted to use this chance also to quickly promote since we're live on Facebook uh, upcoming webinars so next week we will talk with Vesna Yusuf about how European Union works, what is uh, policy making in EU, and then on Wednesday we will talk with Marine Kurtanidze about Council of Europe gender policy making. So uh, everyone is welcome to join. We will be streaming it again. And uh, yeah, hereby uh, I will stop now uh, live streaming.